All right, let's go and review some things we talked about recently. Again, got a short class period today, so moving quickly. We talked about optical density of different substances. We said, well, a substance can't be optically dense unless the substance class is clear. Or what's the physics -y word for that? The other one. Definitely not opaque. Transparent, there we go. Transparent objects have a certain degree of optical density to them. And optical density in plain English is... Ability to slow down light. Now, the resistance to the transmission of light rays. Okay, whatever. It's ability to slow down light. And we said based on how fast light goes through certain media, if we compare then that speed with the speed of light in a vacuum, we get that substance's what? What are the ladies? Refractive index. Good. So it's directly tied to the optical density of the medium. The refractive index kind of quantifies that in a sense. And we said that the refractive indices of two media allow us to determine the behavior of light when light passes from the one medium into the other. Um, obviously, when light goes from one transparent medium into another, if it has to change speed because of different refractive indices, uh, different optical densities, it will also change direction. We call this change in direction? Refraction, and kind of we need to remember that when light is allowed to speed up, it refracts um, away, from away from the normal. And when light is uh, forced to slow down, it refracts okay. toward the normal. We saw that yesterday with the container of water and, and the glass and the, the uh, light beam going from the air into the water and then, of course, through the water up into the air. Um, we said that if you increase the angle of incidence going from the water to the air, from the high density in general to the low density, that angle of refraction gets further and further and further away from the normal until at one point, the light no longer actually escapes out into the air at all. Um, that uh, incident angle required to get a 90 degree refracted angle is called the class critical, critical angle. We saw that yesterday. Um, and uh, any angle greater than the critical angle will produce what phenomenon where the light does not go out but it stays in the first medium? Class? You have to see this with the uh, water stream coming out of the bottle as well where the laser beam was redirected down into the sink. What's that called where the laser beam or the light ray stays in the first medium rather than escaping out? Total internal reflection. Total internal reflection. We got to look at all of that yesterday. We had some math with that on the handout that you completed for homework last night. I can see yours. I can kind of see yours. And I can see yours. Excellent. Let's look at the first one. Light travels through a particular liquid at a speed of 2.78 E8 meters per second. What is the refractive index of this liquid? How do we find refractive index? What's that first equation I told you to know? from this chapter, Kendall? There we go. We're going to assume, class, that C is? 3.08. And it says that the speed of light through this particular liquid is 2.78 E8 meters per second. Of course, the meters per second cancel. For that matter, the E8s could cancel. If you want to think of those like units, and uh, so we just get 3 divided by 2.78, which gives us what for our answer, Kendall? 1.08. It rounded 1.08, very low refractive index. I'm not sure what kind of liquid could possibly have a refractive index this low, but whatever. Theoretically, that would be the answer to this problem. How many had that answer to the first problem? How many thought that refractive index was awfully low? I mean, considering water's at 1.3. This is something that's a lot less optically dense than moving water somehow. So I'm not sure if that's even possible, but whatever. All right, looking across at the next problem, light passing from air into plexiglass is incident at 31.5 degrees. What is the angle at which the light refracts? Again, angle of incidence does not equal angle of refraction. Rather, Snell's law comes into play. And what is Snell's law, Michael? Mm -hmm. And uh, you sound really sleepy, like those math tests you just took, just took it out of you. You all right? Fine. Fine. Okay. Seems sort of morose. 
lethargic. I'm not sure which of the two, maybe a combination of both. Anyway, you are correct though. N1 times sine theta I equals N sub 2 sine theta sub R. And uh, so the first substance class in this problem was mm, air. air. It started out in air. So air is the, uh, the first medium. And it said the light was incident at 31.5 degrees. So we plug in air's index of refraction, and we plug in the 31.5 for the theta sub i. The plexiglass, I told you, has a 1.51 index of refraction. We wanted to find the theta sub r. So we need to multiply, divide up the 1.51, and then take the arc sign to get the theta sub r by itself. What did you get for that refracted angle, Michael? Uh, 20.25 degrees. 20 degrees, or round at the third sig fig, 20.3 degrees was your final answer. How many have a 20.3 degrees? Excellent. Look at the next one. Light passing from quartz into water refracts at an angle of 47 degrees. What is the angle of incidence? Um, again, it starts out class in quartz. So this is going to be the quartz side. And uh, this side over here is going to be, Audrey, the... All right, so for the N sub 1, we should have plugged in the 1.46. Um, but you're finding the angle of incidence, so we should have left the theta sub i as it was. The water, 1.33 refractive index, and then the refractive angle, 47.0 degrees. By the way, before we even work it, it's going from quartz into water. You could go off the refractive indices, or you just think practically, which one should be more optically dense? The quartz should have the higher optical density. It does. It has the higher refractive index. So if it's going from quartz into water, Audrey, should we expect the light to speed up or slow down? Slow From quartz into water. It should speed up, right? Water should provide less impedance, so to speak, to the light rays than the quartz would. So if it's going to speed up, it should refract away from the normal. So this should be the bigger angle. We should have the smaller angle in the higher optical density medium. So I should expect something smaller than 47 degrees. Now there's not a huge difference between the refractive indices, so I'm not expecting something way smaller like 20, but I am expecting something maybe in the high 30s-ish. We're going to multiply, we're going to divide, we'll take the arc sign. What did you get for the theta sub i, Audrey? 41.8. It was even higher than high 30s. 41.8 degrees when you're round is correct. Did we get 41.8 degrees? Good, again, that's kind of how you check your own answer is, or even before you do the problem, think, what should I expect to happen? Does that happen? And if so, then we're on the right track. Usually, if you screw up, you're going to screw up big enough by maybe putting something in the wrong spot or forgetting to take an arc sign. Get something that's just crazy small or doesn't jive with what common sense and, and education tells us then that tells us our answer is wrong. This does jive with what I was expecting, maybe a little higher than I anticipated, but not by much. Um, looking at the last one, determine the critical angle for light passing from a diamond into ethanol. Now, we actually looked at diamonds yesterday with diamond air, because let's be honest, most of the time, if we're looking at the sparkle of a diamond, well, I don't have a diamond, but if we're looking at the sparkle of a diamond, it's in light. We're not usually, here, let me put my hand in ethanol. Now look how it sparkles. Okay, we, no, we corn alcohol, you know, <laughs> why are we doing this? Uh, but anyway, theoretically, just for the sake of a problem, critical angle from light passing from a diamond into ethanol. What's the equation for critical angle, Kendall? Um, All right, so the n sub 2 is the refractive index of the second medium. The light is trying to escape the diamond into the ethanol. ethanol. So the ethanol's refractive index goes on top, and that was the 1.36. We put the diamond's refractive index, the 2.42, on the bottom. And again, if you got this backwards, you're going to get an error message, which means flip it and try it again. And so we divide, we take the arc sign. What did you get for that critical angle? Round in 34.2 degrees. Did we all get that for the last one? All right, so it seems like we were all perfect on the handout. feel like we've got a good handle on this basic math. All right, excellent. Go ahead and set that aside. If you would, turn to page 300. Let's begin talking about lenses. Now, Audrey, you wear glasses sometimes. You're usually a contact person, but you do have glasses. Mm -hmm. Michael, you also, okay, I don't know that I've ever seen you with glasses. Kendall, you're the one with the good eyesight. All right, snob. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> All right, so uh, lenses. I'm very familiar with lenses, obviously, having gone to the eye doctor a number of times in my life and had a thing to get new lenses. There's a website called Zenny Optical. I don't know if you've heard of it with glasses people. Um, I got a pair of glasses for six bucks. I heard of that. Hey, really cheap. I mean, which is better than going to the, you know, 
wherever you usually go, you spend four or five hundred dollars. So I'm like, hey, this is where it's at. Until I got my glasses back, and they just they just didn't fit my face right. It just no. But I learned a lot about lenses from doing it because it asks for the focal length of the lens and the optical center location and all different things that it asks for when you go onto Zenni Optical. So I thought it was really neat at that point. I've been teaching physics for a few years, so I knew kind of the theory behind it. But it really came to mean a little bit more to me when I did that. And I don't know if I still have those glasses or if I finally threw them away. I went and got a real eye exam done uh, after many, many years. Prescription didn't change much from my uh, college days, um, which, you know, that's been 15 years now. <laughs> and so, uh, but I got glasses that actually felt good on my face, which that's, that's half the battle. And then, of course, you contact people and you just get your contact lenses. But anyway, lenses. I get this term in your notes. If you want a lens is a transparent object with non-parallel surfaces. A lens is a transparent object with non-parallel surfaces. A window has parallel surfaces, right? The one side of the pane of glass is flat, the other side of the pane of glass is flat, and so it's not really a lens. You see through it, but it doesn't do anything really to the light. Even if the uh, glass were to be curved, or maybe plastic were to be curved. You ever seen one of those um, domed windows, curved windows? But the key is they curve both paint, both sides of the pane so that they stay together. Well, that would still not be a lens if the two surfaces curve together. A, a Coke bottle, the, the, the surface curves with it. But if one of the surfaces curves differently from the other, or if one surface is flat while the other surface is curved, or maybe you've noticed at the bottom of the windshield, perhaps in your car, if you look down there, weirdness happens right at the very bottom. That's usually because as it's coming down, the two surfaces tend to bulge out just a little bit from each other. At that point, they're not parallel anymore. Now you get a little bit of a distortion that's caused by a lens. Again, if you go to the eyeglass store and you see all the little demos, they have just clear plastic in there. That does nothing. It doesn't help you see better. Though, interesting science project, when I was in, um, I don't know, ninth or 10th grade, somebody in my class did black plastic lenses and they punched little holes in the plastic lenses. It was amazing, you could actually see better. It allowed the light to focus just a few rays. And um, I, I, was, I was really, really shocked when I put them on because I had pretty bad eyesight. And they had big holes and little holes punched. I put the big holes on, really no difference. Put the little holes on, it was amazing. I could actually see pretty clearly. So it's like, hey, if you want a budget, I just limit the number of rays your eyes have to process, and it, it actually really does help. Um, it's one of the reasons why sometimes you'll see an older person, if they're trying to like, they'll squint. What does that do? It, it kind of closes off the opening, or they make a really small hole with your finger, and you can actually see pretty clearly. Um, where right now, Audrey's hands are a blur, but this I can actually see individual fingers. Um, so anyway, it, it's just, it's kind of neat uh, how that works. Uh, that's for another, another topic for another time, but if you're really on a budget. Um, but anyway, um, lenses. The idea, of course, is to help focus the light or to cause the light to do what we want it to do. Um, there's different shapes of lenses you see at the top of page 300 based on the surfaces, and there are two of them, of course. So the first one you see is concavo-convex. The right side is concaved in, the left side is convexed out. Plano convex, one side flat, one side bulging out. Double convex, both sides bulge. Double concave, both sides cave in. Plano concave, one side caves in, one side's flat. Convexo concave, one side bulges out, the other side caves in. Right, you get the idea. Two surfaces, different shapes of lenses you can have. But all lenses are going to be broken down into two categories based on what they do to light. Lenses will either be considered converging or diverging. Converging or diverging. Let's talk about converging lenses, first of all. When you hear about something or a group converging, I think of like, you know, military strategy and talking about battles throughout history and, and the, uh, you know, the Union and Confederate armies converged at Vicksburg or whatever, right? You, you, converge just means they all came together. They were at different places and they all came together. A converging lens, as you see on page 300, will cause light rays that were running parallel to come together. Even light rays that were spreading outward that are caught by the lens will be brought back together. They'll be forced to come together. So a converging lens causes light rays to come together. 
the most common converging lens is a double convex lens. And you see that picture, that double convex, and you should know that. Double convex, the most common converging lens. I have a few different double convex lenses. I've got um, this one here. And you can kind of see from the side how both sides bulge outward, okay, just a little bit. It's a nice big lens. I've got another one here that um, very, very thin. You can just barely tell there's a bulge outward in both directions. But it's also double convex. Um, I've got another one here that's really fat. <laughs> and uh, also, very more obviously, I think, double convex. And uh, all three of these are converging lenses. All three of these will cause light rays to come together, as we'll see in a moment. This one here is a diverging lens. You can see that it's really thick, but then the sides bulge inwards. You can see how my fingers are actually kind of within the thickness of the lens. This would cause light rays not to come together. But what's interesting is, if I look at you, I can see you through the lens just fine. Right? And you're all little. In fact, if you look through the lens, Kendall, you can see that I'm a little. Now, I don't know how well you can see that. Um, but when you look through, for instance, this one, um, it's, it's, it's weird. That's even weirder, isn't it? <laughs> um, and so, and right now, I mean, I can kind of see some stuff, but it's upside down. It's weird. Okay, converging lenses do different things. So we're going to be looking at all of this over the next couple of days. Diverging lenses, however, do not cause light rays to come together. Rather, diverging lenses cause light rays to spread outward. Diverging lenses cause light rays to spread outward. A little bit later on, a couple more days, we'll get to how do you use these in optics, like for instance, like with eye, eyeglasses. We'll get to that in a little bit. Not today. Diverging lenses cause light rays to spread outward. Now, again, there are lots of different diverging lenses. My glasses, for instance, okay, and I can't see now because it's too far away from my eyes, but you can see this is basically behaving the same way this one did. These are diverging lenses. And again, we'll talk about all of this a little bit later. These are not double concave. In fact, if you kind of look, you can see the one side bulges out very slightly, the side, and then the side toward my eye is the one that's caved in. So it doesn't have to be double concave, but double concave is an easy one to use for um, your diverging lenses. I don't think this is going to show up well on video, but we'll give it a try anyway. Michael, if you'll turn out the lights, at least those of you in the classroom will be able to see this. Um, but some interesting demonstrations we can do here. Let me use a couple of uh, these light sticks that we used once before for um, the, um, tell you what, let me do this. Let me uh, try to zoom in, and by zooming in, that also would allow you folks to come around to this side. So Audrey, go behind the camera. I kind of just kind of slide over here. Michael, you can walk wherever you want because, you know, you're an adult now. And uh, <laughs> so we're going to take these, these light sticks here and... Um, I come around to this side here. We'll just use the back side of this paper here, and you can see that the, uh, the three light rays are roughly, roughly parallel to each other. You can kind of even see them across the tabletop here. You can see green, red, blue, whatever. They're, they're all hitting the screen. But you see when I put the let this in front of them, that it causes, well, you, you, it's not trapping all the rays, but you can see how it pushes the green, the red, and the blue further apart. We may be able to even get a little bit of a fog here in the area. And um, allow you to see those light rays a little bit more. Okay, again, they're kind of spreading outward in a number of directions. These may not be as good as lasers, but um, kind of see how, in fact, if you look at the table, you can see it across the tabletop as well. Can you all see the table right here? Come a little closer, the camera's not catching you yet. You can see how the blue and the red rays, instead of running parallel, spread out, or the red and green rays are forced, are forced to spread outward. However, when you bring in something like this, this is going to focus the rays closer together until they actually coincide, and they just flip. Do you see how the green and the blue flip places? Of course, the red stayed in the middle. We can see that it just pushes those light rays in closer. They all converge right about here, right? So this would be about that that point, again, it kind of depends on where the lens is, how much of it they capture, but right about there, we see them converging together. We do this with lasers as well, and I need a couple people with steady hands like uh, 
um, Kendall and uh, Audrey here, and I should have left the batteries in from yesterday. I forgot about this demonstration when I took them out, and then, of course, with achievement testing, I didn't have time to get these back in. But uh, who do we trust with the red laser? Kendall feels more dark side. Okay, so Kendall, oop, without shining in a face, I bumped the button. I don't trust myself with a red laser. All right, and um, Audrey will give you the green laser. What I want you ladies to try to do is hold the lasers so they kind of are going to be side by, hey, thank you, uh, kind of run side by side with each other. Give the illusion of parallel rays. Michael, I'll have you hold the lens in just a moment. Now, Kendall, you don't have to hold your button down, obviously. Uh, Audrey, you're going to have to, and I put the batteries in backward. Mm. Instant replay shows. <laughs> okay, yeah. All right, so let me go ahead and fog up the area a little bit more. And this one actually might show up a little bit better on video anyway. So ladies, if you'll go ahead and run the lasers, uh, put maybe one above the other. So maybe put your hands, you're gonna have to put your hands next to each other here. And uh, this is why I had you two do it. All right, really close together. I want those two lasers about an inch apart. And try to run the beams parallel. All right, so we have those beams running parallel here. Now, Michael, if you would fog up the area a little bit more. And uh, we're going to put the, uh, keep them running parallel, nice and tight together here. All right, Michael, a little, little closer together, like really close together. Really close. There we go. Yeah, you're going to have to put your hands right up against each other here. Okay. All right. All right. And uh, run in parallel. And of course, we get a little bit of reflection here. But you also see right at this point, the laser beams coming together. Now, Michael, if you'll do it with this one. So hold that laser beam, or that uh, in the laser beams. Keep those tight together, ladies. And we see it again, what happening right here, we see those laser beams converging. All right, next lens. See if the smoke is gonna, or the fog is gonna keep, fill the air well enough for us here. Now here, you almost might not be able to catch it. You see it's right here. And again, I'm not sure camera how much of that you're able to catch, but it's right there, right above Michael's finger. Do you notice they all have different points at which the light rays converge? They all forward focus the light differently. But now with this laser beam, or with that uh, lens, rather. You see how those beams spread back outward now? They also get really big on the far wall. The beam itself gets spread outward, not just the beams separated from each other. But we see how the beam itself is then spread outward. Okay, So um, again, we see how the convergence and divergence works. Now I'm going to try it here. I'm not going to be able to see anything with my glasses. Um, try not to fog the actual glasses here, because I want to be able to see. But um, we can see that these lenses here are causing the two light beam rays to spread outward as well. Okay, so diverging lenses, and we'll see how fog these got. All right, thank you. And uh, we can go ahead and turn the lights back on. Again, I don't know how much of that was caught on video. Probably very little. My apologies. A lot of demonstrations are just not well done on video, but we tried. You guys at least saw it. So um, anyway, all right. Um, so converging, diverging lenses. Um, we've got the idea there. Now with the lens, we want to talk about different parts of the lens. And one of the things I'm just going to use a uh, double concave lens to show. I'm going to be true of any lens. There is a point at the very middle of the lens, if it's made well, called the optical center. The optical center of the lens. Now, when they grind the lenses, this, this haze is going to bother me. Uh, when you, they grind lenses for people to actually wear, they want to know exactly where the pupil of your eye is. So you actually measure stuff so you can set the optical center because that's where you should theoretically be looking through the haze. Um, if we were to run a line right through the middle of the lens, we should pass through that point, and this here is called the optical plane. Perpendicular to the optical plane, running right through the optical center, is uh, called the principal axis, and you probably would have guessed that title, only because of what we talked about with mirrors, right? A lot of the terminology is going to be similar. Now, with a converging lens, we just looked at it. Light rays that come parallel, what's going to happen? 
They're going to bend in and they're going to meet at some point somewhere along here that we call the focal point. So the focal point is through the lens. Now, you say, well, what about the diverging lens? Well, theoretically, there would be a focal point. They just don't actually focus there. But there is this point at which, theoretically, the light would focus. For sake of uh, ray diagrams later, there will be another point called the double focus, or that double focal length away. So we have here the optical center. We have the focal point, and we have our double focal point. Now, for our purposes, we are going to assume that when light refracts, it refracts at the optical plane. Okay, so we're going to assume the refraction happens here at the optical plane. In reality, and the book shows this, there's actually two refractions that take place. There's a refraction that takes place at the surface of the glass, and there's another refraction that takes place after the surface of the glass. Uh, I believe I showed this to you when we were um, doing the demonstration yesterday with the water tank. I noticed that the glass causes a little bit of distortion, uh, causes a little bit of refraction itself, and then the water as well. For our purposes, though, even though all of everywhere you look in the book, if you look at these pictures, you see two different refraction points. We're going to assume one because it's easier to draw the ray diagram. So rather than having a light ray come in, blue laser now, having the light ray bend in toward the normal and then bend out like this, we're going to assume the light goes in to the optical plane and then bends in. It's very similar in the result anyway, so we're not going to account for the two refraction points. We'll just assume the one, of course, technically the light would refract at the focal point, but you get the idea. On this side, the same distance that the focal point is away, we'll have something called the secondary focus. Now, you notice for all of the lenses that the light does reflect off of the lens as well. Did you notice, perchance, I didn't point it out with this diverging lens, that when the light rays ref reflected off, some light went through, some light reflected, that the reflected rays actually came together. That would have been at the secondary focal point. And then we'll take this same distance again and have a double secondary focus. So the lens has an optical center. We'll take this optical plane that's perpendicular to the principal axis. That's where we're going to assume our refraction takes place. We've got our focal point, double focal length, secondary focus, double secondary focal length. Now, I do want to point this out. The focal length, this distance here, does not equal half the radius of curvature. There are some differences between lenses and mirrors, and this is one of the biggest. The focal length is not half the radius of curvature. Well, there's a good reason for that. There's two radii. All right, there's two sides to the lens. Now, on all of my lenses, they're curved the same. The curvature of one side is the same as the curvature on the other side. Very slight curvature, one side, same slight curvature on the other. But they could be different, even with my glasses, right? We see that. There's one curvature here, there's a separate curvature there. So we don't assume the radii of curvature. Rather, focal length depends on three things. It first of all depends on both radii of curvature, and it depends on the index of refraction. The focal length depends on both the radii of curvature, boring again, and it depends on the index of refraction. So for instance, if you could imagine a lens made out of diamond somehow, okay? Expensive, obviously, but if you could imagine a diamond big enough you could cut a lens out of it, well, it's going to cause the light to refract much more quickly than, say, this glass would. Or, for instance, if I took some plastic and I made a solid piece of plastic, well, that's not going to refract the light as quickly as a piece of glass would. Okay, so different substances refract glass, the reflect, refract light differently. So the focal length depends on both radii of curvature and on the refractive index. From your homework reading a couple of nights ago, that lens maker equation is what pulls all of those things together. We'll get to that in our next lesson. Now, we can use ray diagrams, though, like we did for uh, mirrors, right? We did all those ray diagrams for mirrors. If you look in your textbook at page 302, you see a, an example of a ray diagram that uses those three principal rays. The three principal rays that you need to know, first of all, you have the central ray. 
Because say, that sounds familiar. Right, except the central ray doesn't go through the center of curvature. That would be for a mirror. Rather, it goes through the optical center. It goes through the optical center. And because it passes directly through the optical center, there is no refraction. Just as there was no, you know, reflecting off a mirror to a different point, it just went through the center of curvature and back, this goes through the optical center unrefracted. Through the optical center unrefracted. You see that green ray picture at the top of page 302. All right, that's Luke's lightsaber. And then you, <laughs> and then you have the, uh, the parallel ray. The parallel ray, and that'd be Obi Wan, and uh, or or Luke's Luke's father uh, initially. Anyway, um, so the blue ray, right? Uh, the parallel ray. Well, obviously, it's going to start parallel to the principal axis. Now, again, they show two refractions. We're going to assume one refraction of the optical plane, but it refracts through the focal point. So parallel to the principal axis and refracting through the focal point. The parallel ray, parallel to the principal axis, hence the name, and then refracting through the focal point. And I just realized I never reset the camera. So I'm not sure how, well, most of it got caught on camera anyway. That works. <laughs> Oops. <sighs> Life is easy when you don't record it. <laughs> it's all good. Uh, the parallel ray. Um, it's love, Gavin. That's why we do it, because we love you. All right? Uh, focal ray is the last one, the focal ray. Now the focal ray doesn't actually go through the focal point, it goes through the secondary focus F prime. The focal ray goes through the secondary focus and refracts parallel to the principal axis, and that's the Darth Vader ray that you see on page 302. The focal ray goes through the secondary focus and refracts parallel to the principal axis. We were going to draw some ray diagrams. We really don't have time. Uh, we got a little bit of a late start because achievement testing went a little long and classes are shorter anyway. So we will forego drawing them, uh, though they're great fun. Um, they're actually a little bit easier to draw than the mirrors were because the rays don't have to reflect back on themselves. Um, but anyway, we see a number of ray diagrams pictured here. All right, questions on the principal rays. Again, same three names and largely same behaviors. Now, for a converging lens, it kind of mirrors, if you wanna jot this down, when you think converging lens, think concave mirror. Very similar in the way that they uh, behave with the result at least, okay? The, the result is very similar. And when you think of a diverging lens, think of a convex mirror. Again, very similar in the result uh, that is formed. The book mentions five cases of a converging lens. I'm going to give you six cases of image formation for a converging lens, just as I gave you six cases of image formation for a concave mirror. The first case isn't pictured here, but it is pictured back on pages 300 and 301. If an object is, practically speaking, an infinite distance away, case number one, if an object is an infinite distance away, and again, we relative, just like with the mirror, the image will be a point image at the focus. For a converging lens, oftentimes that double concave lens, okay, for a converging lens, if the light source, the object, so to speak, and it would have to be a light source, is practically speaking an infinite distance away, a point image is formed at the focal point. A point image is formed at the focal point. However, just like with the concave mirror, as you bring the object closer, we see what the book calls case one, I will call case two, if the object is beyond double the focal length away. We see the picture there at the bottom of page 302 now. If the object is beyond the double focus length away, notice the light goes through the lens. Remember for mirrors, we said light's supposed to reflect off a mirror. If it seems to go behind a mirror, it's virtual. Well, a lens, light is supposed to go through. If light doesn't go through, if the image doesn't go through the lens, that's virtual. 
So that's the flip side. I did less time than I thought I did because the clock is slightly off. We'll pick up with cases of image formation in our next lesson. No homework, no written homework at least. I would encourage you to skim over these pages a little bit in preparation for tomorrow, but no written homework tonight. Have a wonderful rest of your day, and you are dismissed.